Blog Talk Radio. Hi, I'm author and publisher Tracy L. Slatten. It's my belief that the most interesting, creative, and original voices today are heard outside of the big corporations, studios, and galleries. Individuals of courage, inspiration, and vision are seizing the opportunities to create and promote their art themselves. I'm here to support them and to bring their stories to you. On this show, I'll interview independent artists of all kinds, unusual thinkers, and even some healers about their process. How do they do it? How do they start with an idea and bring it to life in the world? This show intends to illuminate the journey. Feel free to call in to 516-453-6052 with questions or live chat with me at blogtalkradio.com slash independent artist thinkers. Great to have you with us. of Independent Artists and Thinkers, and we are back. Uh, the day before Thanksgiving, we're back after a few months of a hiatus, and I'm so excited, and I'm thrilled that it's right before Thanksgiving, because Thanksgiving um, is one of my favorite holidays. It always allows me the opportunity to be grateful and to extend loving wishes and loving gratitude to all my friends and loved ones, and just to really contemplate how good things can be and how good things are and offer that up to the universe with a lot of love and joy. So um, welcome back. And I'm so happy today because we're doing a show with an independent thinker who made a film about an independent thinker. How cool is that? Um, So before we get right into talking to Malcolm Carter, I'm going to just catch everyone up on some things that have been going on for me and for my husband's uh, sculptor, Sabin Howard. And that is, um, I have a new novel out called The Year of Loving. It's getting some great reviews now that the election cycle is kind of over and people can think about something other than the election in the United States. Um, So The Year of Loving, the back copy says, Art gallerist Sarah Page's world is crumbling. One daughter barely speaks to her and the other is off the rails. Sarah is struggling to keep her gallery afloat in a tough market when she learns that her most beloved friend has cancer. In the midst of her second divorce, two men come into her life, an older man who offers companionship and stability, and an exciting younger man whose life is as chaotic as hers. Sarah's courage, humor, and spirit strengthen her, but how much can she bear and what sustains her when all else falls away? So that's the year of loving, and if you know anything about my novels, you know I'm really interested in this question of what sustains us in the face of hardship and travail and how we still find joy in the face of that. Um, My latest piece on the Huffington Post is called Careful Traveling Over the Holidays, so look up that on the Huffington Post. And in case you haven't heard, my husband Sabin Howard's work for the World War I Memorial is all over the news. The Wall Street Journal and the Epic Times both ran terrific articles on Sabin's work. News 12, The Bronx was in his studio, and Fox TV had run a modern master's profile of Sabin a few months ago, and they ran it again on Veterans Day. So you can look at the Wall Street Journal, Epic Times, Fox Modern Masters. It's on the Fox5ny.com channel, as well as in YouTube and TV 12, The Bronx. So, So back to the show. I'm so happy that so many people listen to the show live and in the archives and in the podcast channel on iTunes and Blueberry and Stitcher. Um, I can see from my feed that I have plenty of subscribers and lots of listens. So I'm really grateful. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you really enjoy these shows and the guests because I do. I created this show to support those brave souls who are operating outside the structures of the big established corporations. As the intro to the show says, I intend to illuminate the unusual journey and to bring it to you. I'm interested in alternatives to conventional thinking and conventional answers. I'm interested in creativity, fresh ideas, unusual perspectives, and originality. And this show aims to bring you models of people who embody those qualities that I really think I have today. 
so I'm going to get right to it. I'm so delighted and so honored today to have Malcolm Carter. Malcolm Carter is an award-winning filmmaker and director. Over the last 20 years, his work has appeared on 544 television networks in 155 countries, and it has reached a combined global audience of over 2 billion viewers. How cool is that? Malcolm is passionate about using the power of film to make a difference in the world by communicating messages that matter. He has extensive expertise in creating compelling communications with global impact, and he is known for being able to work with visionary thought leaders and advanced thinkers to translate and synthesize their ideas in an understandable way to a wide audience. This has led to work with NASA think tanks and with global humanitarian organizations. Malcolm is also known for creating cinematic, engaging, and emotionally compelling films, films that touch the heart, films that inspire and inform the mind, and also, I would add, inform the soul. Focused on global messaging, Malcolm is part of a global network of top filmmakers in over 40 countries that shares communication strategies, film techniques, and local contacts to truly enhance the ability to film affordably around the globe. And that, of course, is a big consideration. Malcolm currently lives in Vancouver, Canada, and was the director of the Asian Winter Games for the International Olympic Committee of Asia 2011. He also is an advocate for mental health and worked with Kaiser Foundation Films. Malcolm is a member of the International Forum of Mo Motion Picture Producers, Billion Minds Foundation Board of Governors, and various think tanks, NASA, Ames, Colorado School of Mines, Talbert Forum. Some of his selected awards are 25 Motion Picture Award nominations, Best Director, Best Documentary, Best Promotional Film, Best Public Service Film, Best Music Video, Best Educational Film, Best Program Reflecting Cultural Diversity, Walter Klein Award, and Freddie. Malcolm, hello. Thank you for coming on. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Tracy. It's such a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me on today. I look forward to sharing ideas of the connected universe with your uh, fans and listeners and followers. <laughs> me too. I'm really, I'm so happy. This is really exciting for me. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today because your film, The Connected Universe, is utterly fascinating and wonderful. I really loved it. Uh, Thank you. But let's start. You're welcome. And I hope everyone goes out to see it, and I really think they should. But let's start. I have a usual opening question with my for my guests, and I at, open with this one because it situates listeners into who my guests are and what they're about. And it's a big question, so take it and run with it and make it your own. Answer it the way it feels right for you. So here's it. Big question. How did you begin your journey, and what has it taken for you to arrive at the place where you are currently? What training did you have? When did you know you were going to be involved with filmmaking in general and with inspirational filmmaking in particular? Was film or science a major presence in your home when you were growing up? What did you think you would be? So start with your childhood and lead up till now. Well, thank you. That is a big question indeed. Um, if I actually think things did begin way back when when I was young. I actually... Uh, when I was very little, we moved to the Northwest Territories in Canada, Yellowknife, the capital of the Northwest Territories. And there, um, uh, we, being that part of Canada, it was a very different kind of um, experience because during the winter, it was pitch black walking to school and pitch black walking home because uh, there was only a few hours of, of uh, daylight in the winter and then of course in the summer the <clears throat> the daylight goes um nearly round the clock not quite where we were but what was special about that is i actually became uh friends with some uh indigenous people some aboriginal people and and uh and had exposure to inuit people and realized that there were different ways of thinking in the world than just what i was growing up with and what i was being taught and so that actually made a deep impression on me. The other thing was that we were really out in a in a beautiful part of nature. The Arctic has an interesting beauty. It's desolate, but it is also uh, profoundly beautiful. And as uh, we had a big chunk of the Precambrian Shield out of our, near our backyard, and we were little mountain goats running around outside wow. all the time, 
playing and um i really <clears throat> because also we, we being back back in those days uh we only had television access for four hours a day um from the annex satellite so uh, we spent a lot of time outside in nature so i think a couple of things that informed my journey was that early on i really got an appreciation and connection to nature and really um, being able to play and explore in that and understanding that, you know, as I walked to school with my indigenous friend, that there was an entirely different way of looking at the world. Well, Mm -hmm. fast forward um, and uh, we moved to uh, St. Albert, Canada, which is, uh, is in Alberta near Edmonton. And there, um, grew up and that was a more that was a more urban area but then something happened on my dad's side of the family one of our relatives passed away and mm-hmm. one of the things that we got was a set of encyclopedias from 1900 and what was so incredible 1900 yes so what That's was cool. so incredibly fascinating to me was and they were beautiful beautiful books and that you know the kind that they don't really they kind that they don't really make anymore the kind that you see when you go to museums and uh i was just fascinated by the beauty and the knowledge in these books so i would learn something in school and we had one set of cyclopedias from 1973 one from 1945 and one from 1900 so i'd learn something and then i would say hmm what did they? What am I being told now? What did it say in 1973? What did it say in 1945? And what did it say in 1900? And I realized that um, what I was being quote unquote told as fact may in fact not actually be fact. It's just simply the best understanding at the time because seeing the shift, the, these encyclopedias we had, flight wasn't possible. Um, they, you know, back in in that time frame, and so it really gave me a different, I think, perspective of looking at the world to always try to be open, always trying to be learning and recognizing that um, it's good to try to understand um, not only what we know now, but where are there areas in the future that we can look to expand our thinking and to be able to make um, breakthroughs. So on the science side, um, the Connected Universe is, is a movie, I like to think of it like a DNA strand, where one side is one side of the, of the structure, if you visualize as science, the other side is hard in humanity and human experience. And what's beautiful to me about the, the DNA analogy is that when, when you think of that, is that the, the shape, they, they are continually crisscrossing each other and they're intersecting, but there's also bridges holding it together and Mm. um and that this represents to me um the dna contains all the history that has got humanity to this point but it's also our blueprint for the future so from the movie standpoint um we really wanted to have people not just intellectually um, understand the ideas in the movie. We really wanted people to feel the movie. We wanted to uh, have them um, have a have a connection, you know, to to the heart and to the soul and to the beauty. And that's why we we took such effort in the cinematography to be able to um, to get there. But um, well, to make it, a long it answer. Me, it would kind of remind. I just want to say that I make an analogy to the movie Rocky. There were places in the connected universe where I was like, da 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 You know, I just wanted to go <laughs> racing along the bridge with my arms up because I felt like I could do anything. And the movie does Fantastic. have an emotional and impact. It really makes that happen for the viewer. Thank you. Thank you. And that, that, is, that is thrilling, and I'm very glad that that is the response because uh, – my, my two favorite reviews for a movie are tears and goosebumps because when you can when you can get a, uh, a a physical response in someone or that you know that kind of excited rocky feeling where you have actually a feeling in your body from looking at content I mean that is why I'm a filmmaker I make a, I make movies to move people and to be able to empower them to um, have have 
uh, different experiences and to be able to see and feel things in a different way. So I'm thrilled that that is your response. And also we've had just amazing uh, comments from, from people who have already seen uh, the movie. It's been really uh, heartwarming to see. And at the, at the uh, premieres that we've done in, in uh, the Directors Guild Theatre in Los Angeles, we did our global premiere in, in France and at the BAFTA premiere um, in London, we had really beautiful and moving standing ovations at the end of each. Oh, and, wow. Um, that, that was very uh, um, humbling and, and also uh, it was really beautiful that the film is connecting with people in the way that we hoped. Well, how did you decide to start making films? Like, what was your first film? Well, interestingly, um, I uh, I've always loved movies. I, I've been a huge movie fan. I've seen more than three thousand movies in the theater. I still love oh, to wow. go to the to the to the theater once a week if I can. Um, and uh, but when I was young, I I pretty much you know in the days of the multiplex, I would usually see you know 10 out of 12 of the movies I would have uh, I would have seen on a regular basis so I I just loved film's ability to transport and to connect and to take you vicariously into all kinds of different experiences and I really really enjoyed that and so um, I graduated from university with a degree in international marketing and finance with the they wouldn't give me a triple major, but uh, I had mm. a secondary major in psychology. Um, but I was so. My I also, that's, that's <laughs> well, I, I've I've loved learning from the earliest days that I can remember. I I I'm always fascinated in you know new ideas, and in fact, when we used to sit around the table and we were uh, discussing something, if there's something came up we didn't know. Our dad would make us go and look look something up in the encyclopedia or the dictionary to define the word or to uh, look at something because you know we we were always um, inspired to be advancing our knowledge and uh, mm-hmm. so I actually took uh, more courses than I needed at university just because it was a great opportunity to learn from some from some uh, some really good teachers but when I graduated. Uh, I followed the the path sort of of my career, and I, I worked at um, I worked at Xerox in a marketing position, and they had an amazing program. But one day, I asked myself the question: If money was absolutely no object, and somehow I could do whatever I wanted in the world without worrying about um, how I was going to make a living, what would I do? And the answer for me was: Why well, be a filmmaker? And I'm like, well, why? why am I not doing that? I, I'm single. I have no dependents. Um, if I fall flat on my face, I can come back to, you know, this job at Xerox that is, you know, extremely well paying. And, um, you know, I, I'm doing very, very well there. Um, I should, I should give it a try. And so mm-hmm. I set that at, at the end of the year, I would take the big bonus and buy film equipment. And I hit the big bonus on, on the very last day, on December 31st. I was getting the last little deal to be able to get it. And then I bought uh, film film equipment like I had promised myself. And two months later, I entered a citywide contest and won the grand prize. And I was like, wow, wow. not only oh, do I <laughs> well, not only do I totally love it, but, um, you know, there is maybe some hope that I'm even good at it. So uh, because I've seen so many movies, I've been... Uh, I've been studying them, and, and interestingly enough, too, while my brother was uh, reading, he was a voracious reader, and he read a lot of you know fantasy books like uh, Lord of the Rings and that sort of thing. But mm-hmm. I loved co- I loved comic books, and I realize now I grew up reading storyboards. Then I fell in love with movies, <laughs> and so it was kind of a natural thing for me to be able to um, translate that to make uh, into making film so i i decided that i would uh leave the security of my fortune 100 job and everything and just try and go out and see what um see what i could do and that began 25 plus years of uh of filmmaking so that it's a journey that i've never turned back from yeah that's cool well 
Okay, let's turn to The Connected Universe, which features the work of physicist Nassim Haramein. I love this film. As I said, it was so beautiful. It was uplifting. I encourage all my listeners to see it when it's widely available. Um, Thank you. Why did you create The Connected Universe? Well, I have, to me, this is in many ways a culmination of, of life's work. I've spent a lot of time doing humanitarian work around the world, and um, I try and use the power of film to make a difference in the world. And one of the things that I realized, I've seen some truly, truly amazing and wonderful human beings, and I have also seen sources of great challenge. And whenever, whenever I'm seeing what, in my humble opinion, are the worst aspects of humanity, then it always seems to, in physics, you try and look to the underlying patterns of things to try mm-hmm. to understand how and why things are happening. And on the humanitarian side, whenever I would see humanity at its worst, it was always based on fear and disconnection, you know, us against them, me against you, um, you know, the, the you know, me against the world, and that that there was a, a disconnection and a separation. And it's the kind of thing that can allow, you know, humans to torture one another. Uh, it's mm-hmm. the kind of thing that happens in war. And um, so if, if fear and disconnection are at the root of, of the most horrible aspects of humanity, what is at the, at the root of the very best of humanity and no surprise uh, you know, as above, so below, and the the opposites, uh, mm-hmm. and also that the universe has uh, opposites on on many different levels, like in dual dual toroidal forces of uh, uh, that exist in the universe. Love and connection are the things that are opposite of fear and disconnection. So, I wanted to uh, rather than work on just individual projects like I had done with suicide prevention and mental health and addiction and, and new forms of uh, new forms of energy and health and and ways to help people I felt that if we could create more um, uh, love and connection in the world and having people understand uh, and feel the unity that exists that we're so much same. I mean, genetically, we're 99% the same. People talk about all the mm-hmm. different races, but I, I love the expression that there's only one race, and it's the human race. And mm-hmm. this idea that somehow everybody is so different because their skin might be a little different color, or they live in a different place, or there's some cultural differences by our upbringing. Um, we are so similar, and we are so connected, and that if we can learn to uh, work more together, then then we will um, hopefully do better about the way we treat each other in the world. I, I've been very fortunate that um, I've worked with uh, people in, in the Nobel Prize organization, and, and one day I was talking to Guy Tizzoli, who was the founder of the World Trade Center organizations, and you know, he was on the beach killing people and having his friends killed in a war. It's just like, this oh. is absolutely horrific. You know, it is just, how can this be happening? Like, if if we understood each other, if we had business relationships with each other, if we had more to lose, um, maybe we would be less quick to go to conflict. So he ended up setting up a, a series of trade organizations around the world to link to link people by... Uh, to create economic ties with the hope of um, reducing war and conflict because in order to do business with each other, you would have to understand each other, communicate with each other, talk with each other. And um, I've been very, very fortunate in my life that I've had numerous opportunities to uh, to talk to uh, Nobel Prize winners and people who have um, been at the forefront of making some very big positive changes in the world. And my path has taken me on a different, uh, you know, being willing to explore and go out and, and connect in pursuit of these, you know, grand ideas has given me uh, the opportunity to meet some extraordinary human beings. And so a part of 
what I wanted to do to create the connected universe is try to infuse the very best of what I've been able to learn from these other amazing people and to be able to put it in a way that is synthesized and compressed and kind of can connect the dots on different kind of things. I've met amazing scientists, amazing thinkers, amazing peacemakers, um, and, and amazing business people. Um, and, you know, people don't think about, you know, when they're thinking maybe about the connected universe, about somehow that being impactful for their business. But Steve Jobs said, you know, um, that creativity is connection. I mean, he took Mm -hmm. a device which was, you know, purely functional and connected it to his love of, of, uh, of, um, fonts and design and, and, you know, created Apple computers. Mm Mm-hmm. How did you find Nassim Haramein? How did you get? How did you decide to focus on him for this incredibly beautiful movie and the message of connection? Well, that that is an, also an interesting um, story because I was involved in a space project, which would, if we could have gotten it done, would have made a, an extraordinary. Um, contribution to humanity and really helped uh, change the way we uh, we do things on this planet in terms of powering our world. And so that brought me into, you know, the childhood dream of, uh, of meeting astronauts and, you know, becoming friends with the medical director of NASA Johnson Space Center and all kinds of, again, amazing people who've literally been out of this world. And um, I, in, in my... In my work there, I, I realized that um, that Einstein felt that his greatest work was undone, that for all mm-hmm. that Einstein has contributed, and people don't really understand, I think, the impact that Einstein's work has had on our modern world. Um, you know, between Einstein and Tesla, a whole bunch of our uh, things from our modern world have really been substantially advanced from... Uh, from, from the work of those few people. And that Einstein felt that divisions that had happened between cosmological and quantum physics, that there needed to be a way to try to understand the unity of things. And um, this ties back to, to my work with the uh, encyclopedias from 1900, from way back, because science made huge advances by learning to reduce things, by looking at things in isolation. So, you know, instead of just trying to say, oh, how is this happening? They started to try to do experiments where they tried to limit the number of variables so they could determine, mm. okay, this is what's causing this. Malcolm. <laughs> Excuse me. Malcolm? Yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Did you meet Nassim sure. Harmine at a party? How did you find him? What was your no. first meeting like? Okay, so to, so to make a long answer longer, the what happened is <laughs> um, – <laughs> What, what happened was I, I, I pitched the Discovery Show or the Discovery Channel on doing a program for the search on, on unified physics because I found it fascinating that if Einstein felt this was so important, who else is continuing to work on unified theories? And there mm-hmm. were numerous people that, that uh, in my research I found were doing things, and the sim was one of those people. But at the time, um, we couldn't make a show because there was no – Advancement. The story didn't have a third act. It was all about mm. the search, and the movie would have had to end while the search continues. Well, fast forward then, uh, six years from that point, so from 2007 to 2013, and um, that in 2013, I'd heard, and my friends um, knew that I had you know, d- done work with uh, NASA think tanks and that I was involved in taking complex ideas and helping make them understandable for people. And they, um, they said, hey, you know, uh, Nassim has, you know, made what he feels is a breakthrough. You should come check it out because if he has, you're someone who could explain, um, you know, you could explain that to people. And so uh, I said, sure, that sounds great because I'd already been following his work from before, um, but I hadn't met him in person, but I knew his work. And so I flew to Hawaii and I, I went through their um, delegate program, which delved a little into the work. And then I'm, I met with Nassim and, and explored further 
what he had done, and I thought he was really on to something fascinating, and that his uh, not only what he believed that he had found, but also the approach that he was taking and the principles that he was using. Einstein always believed that it would be geometry um, which would provide the answer and not necessarily the complex world of quantum mathematics because at a certain level, the the quantum doesn't work at a larger scale. So somehow, Mm -hmm. although it's very good at understanding the quantum world, (coughs) excuse me, and explaining the quantum world, it didn't work uh, at certain scales. So somehow, well, somewhere, said, there's something right, that's off. Well, your movie said, you know, your movie seems to say that Nassim has reconciled cosmological quantum realms. Well, certainly, certainly, there, uh, the work that he is doing is providing uh, links and step forwards towards understanding uh, that uh, connection of all things in the universe, and that there is a link between the same forces that create the black hole and the forces that are involved in the proton. And so um, as that understanding is continuing to be understood and advanced, uh, that is going to be, I think, a very, very important part because we know our universe is made up of atoms. And if you go back to high school science class, every atom at the center of every atom is the proton. And that Mm -hmm. standard model physics is, is incorrect about the uh, size of the proton. And there were two articles, one, the new scientist, I think their cover was tiny proton, big problem. And on scientific American, they were like, uh, you know, the proton puzzle could, uh, you know, this be ushering in a whole new era of physics. So that um, there is well, always ideas. Go ahead. Yeah, Malcolm, hold one sec. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause to take a, um, a commercial for my sure. book. So hold one sec. Then we'll get Absolutely. back to the proton and the seams work and the connected universe. Hold one sec. When you find an author you love, you read everything they publish. International best-selling author Tracy L. Slatton is one of those writers. Her book Immortal is a rags to riches to burnt at the stake story of an orphan boy in Renaissance Florence. Broken is the story of a fallen angel in Nazi-occupied Paris and her award-winning romantic paranormal dystopian after book series. Also her bittersweet sci-fi romantic comedy The Love of My Other Life. Read one and you will be hooked. Find all of her books at TracyLSlatton.com. We're coming back. Malcolm, we're back. Wonderful. Malcolm, great. So yes. um, watching your movie, which was so inspiring, I mean, there's all the science behind it, um, but here are some of the things I took from the movie. Um, God is a feedback system. I, that's sort of my own interpretation. Uh, consciousness is a system of how space feeds back on itself, which is a dynamic that could generate self-awareness. Gratitude and positive thoughts build on each other, creating a positive spiral and upward spiral. You have the power of the universe inside you, and you can overcome anything in life. You are in a constant cosmic dance with the universe. People can transform themselves and, as a result, transform the universe. Um, And then also it looks like Nassim talks about um, Planck, the Planck pixel soup that fills the universe and his pixelation of you know black holes is kind of what allows his his um, formulas to work and um, so what do you hope that people will take away from the film after they watch it? Well, thank you for uh, for illuminating all those different points. What I what I hope people will take away from the film and and sometimes when I'm doing a live uh, screening of the of the film or or certainly when we were doing our focus testing. We did lots of testing as the the film was being made to make sure it was being understood. Like, for instance, um, I was very, very happy when when I showed the black hole forces to uh, uh, a group of 10-year-olds on Skype, and they were able to understand what uh, what we were what we were doing by by using analogies um, and the by explaining that with the cup of coffee. The coffee. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's a wonderful visual metaphor. That was brilliant. Thank you. And it was really exciting for me that, you know, when this can be properly understood by a 10-year-old, then that's fantastic because 
The goal is to make these ideas ex- as accessible as possible for people. And this is why there's 15,000 hours of work into the project. It could have wow. been far, far simpler if we were just, you know, uh, staying in high level physics speak the whole way and physicists could understand, but uh, nobody else could because it's very, very important, I believe, for everyone to understand these ideas because, you know, your connection with the universe was made long before you were born. The very atoms in your body come from the hearts of exploded stars. And people who are a fan of the TV show Cosmos from Carl Sagan, they would have learned that a long time ago, but not everybody knows that yet. And Mm -hmm. that um, the, the feedback mechanism that the universe uses to create itself and to stay constantly informed about how things work is also important for the human experience because if the universe is using feedback uh, mechanisms to create everything and everything flows into itself repeatedly, then that becomes very important for the principles of thought and for how we live our life and what is the human experience. So a really, really important thing. That was one of my questions is about consciousness. What's the relationship of consciousness Mm -hmm. to what Nassim is talking about? He says, everything spins. Spin may be the one thing that connects us all and talking about feedback. So what's the relationship between consciousness and spin and feedback? How do you make this leap from a grand unified theory of everything and the hearts of stars to human consciousness? Well, and for that, the, I think with the amount of time that we have in the interview to properly do it justice, I, I think we might end up filling up the whole time answering that. And hopefully when people see the movie, <coughs> excuse me, they will also be able to understand um, how that is because we very carefully um, gave people pieces of the puzzle to understand how that works. But to try to synthesize it down is that the universe can't be purely random because the mathematical probabilities that have to exist to, you know, create, you know, even basic life forms by pure randomness can't, um, can't happen. Uh, we, we wouldn't have the world that we have if randomness was the only thing. So uh, in the film, we explain how that works and show, show that in greater detail and, and basically uh, prove that there must be, a feedback mechanism because, you know, for, for, for centuries and even millennia, um, you know, different thought leaders and philosophers and spiritual people said, we are all connected. We are all one, but how the sim really wanted to focus on how are we connected? Like what is the mechanism that makes that connection possible? And if we can understand that, then what, what will that allow us to create? Not only just in, you know, and he's focused on what that will allow us to create in science and physics. And my focus uh, on that is to add what does that mean for the human being and for the human experience. So if you understand that that constant flowing um, and we show those beautiful um, frat patterns in the animation that we got courtesy mm-hmm. of uh, mm-hmm. Tom Bedard that shows that um, – Benoit Mandelbrot used used the you know simply reiterating a, a simple formula and feeding it back on itself can create incredible complexity and tiny little changes to that feedback mechanism and thanks to computers we can run millions of iterations and watch these things happen in real time just like we did uh, in really hyper accelerated time um, like we showed in the movie that as you make these changes, it produces incredible variety and complexity um, in, in different forms. And that is how the universe is working. So if, if there's this constant feedback flow and your thoughts are part of this feedback flow, then it becomes important, um, the imprint that you were leaving on the universe, the thoughts that you have, um, they not only create your reality, but they have an impact on, uh, on the reality because the energy that you put out into the universe is part of the energy that flows back into everything. And this is where there's a really exciting opportunity because when you truly understand 
how that mechanism um, can work, then you also understand that as collectively we raise our collective consciousness, it makes it can continue to make an accelerated impact on how we can change things. Not everybody has to change all at once and for their consciousness to evolve for that to have a big effect is that the more and more people that can add to this feedback loop, the, the positive things continue to build on themselves. And also standing that it's also important to be carefully aware of negative things of, you know, some of the challenges that are existing in the current world dynamic where there's a lot of fear and separation and um, some division happening that it's very important that those things can create downward spirals as also it's possible for good things to create upward spirals. So I think the timing for each individual to understand these ideas and to understand how things work, they can not only make an impact in their own life, but they can also make an impact on the lives of people around them and the world in general. So do you think that the sin will end up when there's a, an equation that he says, this is it, this is my equation of the grand unified theory of everything. Will it include consciousness? Will it include a variable, you know, um, you know, omega equals consciousness? Will, will it have a value? Uh, well, that is a, that is a question better answered by him, but it is his work is leading him into some very interesting um, realms that way, because once you start to understand the underlying forces of the mechanism, then you start to, it starts to become more clear how, how this might actually work. And when, and this is why it's so important to understand how these mechanisms are functioning because the more clearly we can do that, the greater the opportunity to, to understand, um, to understand the overall uh, consciousness and how, how that is literally making an impact and changing the, the world around us and changing. I mean, there's, there's a a lot um, of, of work that has been done showing the interaction of consciousness with, with the quantum world can, can affect how things um, are happening. And so if those dynamics exist, the more we work to understand those, the more impact that, uh, you know, the more potential positive impact we can see as we learn to advance those ideas. Well, I watching the movie, you know, I got a good laugh out of what he was saying about the strong force. Um, yes. <laughs> I started college. I started college as a physics major, but it's been a million years since I, you know, studied that. But I got a good laugh out of that. But I could also see how he could get a lot of pushback from a lot of different yes. places. You know, some of the, the questions I had is, you know, can his work be weaponized? Wouldn't it really be terrible if it could? And uh, there are some people who say. Uh, that we have already, um, we already have gravity control devices, that those are being carefully hidden, that they were reverse engineered out of um, down spacecraft from other civilizations. And if um, Nassim's work is heading in that direction, there, there's going to be a sizable block of people who want him shut down. Also, the petrochemical people, they don't want us to have a better energy system. So I could see how he'd get a lot of pushback on a lot of fronts, both from the scientific, you know, that, that community that is very dogmatized in terms of um, science and then also business concerns that don't want his work to go forward. Is he experiencing that? Well, un- undoubtedly, there, are the, and history has shown that there is a very long track record of things like that happening. And um, it's an unfortunate part of, of humanity's history that we seem to uh, end up repeating that over and over. But there's always vested interests of the day that don't allow um, new ideas to come out. But to me, they, 
we live in an incredibly exciting time because there's really never been a better time in history for advances like this to happen. In the old times, um, there, the control over, <coughs> excuse me, the control over everything was in the hands of fewer people. And now, thanks to some of our modern technologies and capabilities, you know, the idea to not only create messages, but to get them out into the world is, has never been, has never been greater. And to me, you know, we talk in the film about how rapidly human knowledge, you know, how long it took to double the first time and how that doubling of all human knowledge is accelerating at a really dramatic pace. And, you know, they, I remember being surprised by the, you know, by the sentence that say, Oh, you know, 98% of the scientists who ever lived are alive right now. It's like, what? Cool. And then, but wow. when you think, when you think about it, it's just like, wow, you know, that's true is that the, when people were more in their survival mode, they weren't, uh, there weren't as many people working on advancing these ideas. And the other thing is that because of the physical, bar- the physical barriers of distance and separation is that people could be working on amazing things, but have no connection with each other. There's no possibility to share. So, you know, uh, someone could be, and, and there's been numerous times in history where different people in different parts of the world have been working on seemingly almost the exact same thing. Um, right. Yeah. Right, if they, yeah. in the past, they were never able to collaborate. Now we can collaborate. I mean, right now I'm in Vancouver yeah, but, doing your, you know, doing your radio now, show. Now mm-hmm. scientists don't always collaborate and business interests get in the way of that. Because if you go back yeah. to Tesla, who's one of my heroes, Edison went around yeah. electrocuting dogs Absolutely. to prove their alternating current didn't work because Tesla said alternating current is great. We'll use it. And Tesla and Edison said, no, 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 only direct current. So he went around electrocuting dogs to prove Tesla wrong. And of course, we use alternating right. current in the United States. And then the other thing that happened at that yes. time is that, according to what I've read, Tesla had invented a system, you know, an energy system. And Rockefeller said, and it was a, no, it was Morgan. J.P. Morgan said, I can't put a meter on it and charge people, so we won't do it. Right. So we ended up on this right. grid that's expensive, that's polluting our atmosphere, because one wealthy, filthy rich guy – wanted to charge people and get even wealthier and even more filthy rich. So, I mean, that, yes, that, that, that's definitely correct. Well, now, it right. might be right that the strong force is made up, but there's the force of greed and the force of people not wanting to collaborate because they want to be right. Correct. Yes. And, and those, those things are real. And it's unfortunate that um, history often repeats itself in that way. Um, you know, Tesla had invented wireless power, and his his dream was to make power free for everyone. Um, and you can imagine the impact that that would have, um, because uh, power is the modern lifeblood of our civilization. I mean, every, everything we have runs on runs on power, and the energy industry is one of you know is the biggest industry in the world. So. Oh. Now, these, hold one sec. Things. I think we have a question. Yes. Hold on. We have a question. Sure. Caller, you're on. Hello? Hello. My name is Mark. I'm calling. My name is Mark. I'm calling from Nevada, and I had a quick question for Malcolm Carter. Malcolm, are you up for it? Hello, Mark. Yes, absolutely. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge uh, admirer of your work, and I really enjoyed the film. Uh, my, my real question was, what would you say your biggest uh, – our proudest moment was uh, in, in completion of this film. Oh, thank you for the question. I, uh, the, the best moment for me is actually uh, having people share their, uh, their responses and how they have been touched by the film and how, you know, I've had more you know, numerous people um, and share that this has actually transformed their worldview, that it's, that it has helped them to understand uh, understand the universe around them, and that they, you know, it it has helped 
it has helped change their awareness. It's helped change the way that they see the world and that they feel the, the, the way that they feel about the world. And that to me is really critical because there are so many people um, in modern society who are dealing with dealing with depression and a sense of uh, disconnection. And for the years that I spent working in the mental health community um, and dealing with uh, mental health and addiction and suicide prevention is that um, it's possible in today's modern world to get so caught up in the mechanics of, of, you know, chasing money, job, career, intimacy, all those different things that uh, many people are having an experience of feeling disconnected. And yet, when you truly understand the ideas and concepts in this film, it's possible to um, change that awareness and realize that you are more connected than you ever thought possible and that there are are more connections around you and within you than you've ever been told about in your life. And that some people have drawn, uh, you know, have shared that that's made a really big difference for them. And for me, uh, I'm always happiest when I'm helping people. That's why I choose to do more humanitarian and educational work than just pure entertainment work. I love I love going to be entertained by the movies, but for the movies that I make, I like to make movies that help um, people change their experience, make them more informed, and um, that the knowledge that can be shared through the film can help them and help them in their life. And so... Uh, like the standing ovation that we got in France at the end of the movie, uh, it was honestly I could I could feel the you know welling up a little bit because people were so um, grateful to have these ideas out in the world and the ovation went on so long I actually had the chance to look into individual people's eyes and you know nod and say thank you and. Um, really make, you know, quite a few uh, connections because in that instance, instead of being up at the front, we were in the, in the middle of the, we were seated in the middle of the auditorium. So the people were all around us and uh, it was just really heartwarming to see that kind of reaction. So for me, that's what uh, matters most. I appreciate the question. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, great question. Well, congratulations. Congratulations on your film. It's very beautiful. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Thanks for calling in, Mark. That's a great question, Malcolm. How do you feel about humanity's future? I, I'm actually really excited about uh, about our possibilities. Um, I am a little challenged uh, currently at the moment with seeing some um, uh, of the the fear and disconnection that is getting a lot of attention right now, but. Uh, I do, I do definitely believe, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, when you, when you look just beyond what the media is sharing only and realize that the incidence of war is down, crime is down, um, poverty is, you know, that millennium development goals have actually helped to improve poverty, that more people are becoming um, connected on the internet and giving people access to ideas and that uh, I mean who knows where the great you know the next great solutions come from if they come from a child in Africa or they come from you know people all over we're giving more people the chance to I mean nowadays you can you can learn anything um, it's an incredible opportunity to advance your skills and to change your you know, your, your personal experience, but collectively we have the opportunity to stand together and to share our best practices like never before. So throughout mm -hmm. history, you know, we've had amazing people and they've come to some really elevated understandings, but they could only teach, you know, a few people back in, you know, back in the days when um, there wasn't even printing presses, for instance, you had to be telling the person directly you know, the advent of the printing press allowed people to put their ideas into books. 
um, and you know authors like yourself can can express yourself and have that go out and be preserved in a in a wide way. And now with the modern technologies that we have, we have really an unprecedented level to help the best of humanity rise forward. And as we talked well, in the I, movie, technology is a double edged sword. I mean, it can it can be used both ways. But I think the real thing that we're tr- one of the things we're really trying to inspire in the movie is to have people understand the capability that they have, have people understand how they can use this technology for the greater good for themselves and the greater good for humanity, and to that we make a very strong call to action in the film for people to, you know, expand the way they think, open up their awareness, and to be willing to, you know, collaborate and share our best practices. And the more people that we have doing that, the more we can have that shift and the more opportunity there is for the best of us and the best of our ideas to uh, rise to really an unprecedented level, despite the other forces that exist in the world. Yeah, I agree. Just in terms of technology, this is a tiny, intimate little thing, but I'm talking about texting. And I belong to a couple of group text chats one of them is called the family. So like my stepdaughter is a medical student in Arizona and she, you know, we're all connected. My husband, me, my little daughter, my, my oldest daughter, my stepdaughter, we're all connected in this family text chat so that we can all be present with each other in a way that yes. wouldn't have been possible without text because we all just, t- you know, we all text pictures to each other and little comments and, you know, Madeline, my little daughter, had a women in science fair yesterday at the school, and so I took a picture of her presenting Rachel Carson and text, nice. text chatted that. And so, like, my stepdaughter in Arizona, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, would not have been as involved in that moment in her 11-year-old sister's life as she now is. And so we are talking about how technology can yes. overcome disconnection, and we all have this connected sense of knowing what's in each other's life. Anyways, we have two minutes and 40 seconds left, so I need to wind things up. Okay. What are your last words? You've been amazing, Malcolm. I hope you come on again, you know, in a couple months to Thank talk you. more. This this movie is so phenomenal and has so much to offer. So do you have some last words? Thank you. Well, I, I really hope and thank you for saying those wonderful things. We we have put so many things into the movie. We've gotten lots of comments from people that they want to watch it again and again and again because there's so many things that they can pull from the movie. And the real hope is that, you know, if your listeners can be inspired to uh, watch The Connected Universe, I mean, they're there's so many things that they can that they can draw on that hopefully can make an impact in their life and begin their journey. And it's not just the information in the movie, it's also the questions that are asked in the movie. I mean, my life changed with the question of, you know, what could I what would I want to do if, you know, money wasn't an object for me? And mm-hmm. that shifted my whole my whole life path. And we, we ask some big questions in the movie and we explore some fascinating ideas and I would love people to, you know, the, the, the movie is, uh, is, uh, I, I, is 98 I, I, minutes Malcolm. long. <laughs> Malcolm, tell yeah. where people can find out more about you. Please come on the show again, but tell people yes. website yep. or how to, how to follow yes. you on social media. Yep, the the connecteduniversefilm.com, so www.theconnecteduniversefilm.com, and it's available there. You can see the links to the Vimeo On Demand where you can buy or rent the film. Uh, we have a Facebook page, The Connected Universe, and we're, we're on Twitter as well and starting to do uh, more things on Instagram. Right, so if Malcolm, you can, I, if you can look for us there, bye. yes. I Thank you. Thank you so much. You were amazing and awesome and happy. I don't know if I you celebrate it. So are you. the same thing. You have a different Thanksgiving in Canada, but I hope you have millions of things to be grateful for. Well, being grateful every day is a great way to be. So thank you so much for, uh, for helping share this message with your listeners. And again, um, we'd love you to take a look at the movie. Thank you all so much. Okay. Thanks. Have a wonderful Bye. day. Bye-bye. That was the amazing Malcolm Carter talking about this film and I'm not going to play my usual outro so because I don't have time but it was worth a second
to hear Malcolm Carter. So to all my listeners, happy Thanksgiving and have a wonderful, wonderful day. And go see the ConnectedUniverse.com. <laughs>